All right, so for those of you who can't tell by my very thick Nigerian accent, I've only been living here for a year. And when I moved here last year, I moved here January 20th, and then one day later on the 21st, I went to Audi to buy groceries. I got to Audi and I didn't know that you're supposed to wait until it's your turn to be served before you go behind and collect your groceries. So the person in front of me is checking out and I'm walking behind him like, breathing on his leg like, <laughs> And the lady is like, I don't know how to pronounce it in a British tone, but she's like, are you all right? And where I'm coming from, when somebody asks you that question, I'm basically saying, are you mad? And I don't know when I switch, I was like, uh-uh, of course I'm all right. What do you mean? Are you all right? And everybody started looking at me like this crazy person. All right, now that I have your attention, my name is Chima Meje, and I am an SEO content writer and strategist working primarily with SaaS companies. Today, I am going to be talking to you about how to do thorough research when building a B2B topic cluster. You need to pay attention because I talk like I have hot yam in my mouth. So everything you're going to be hearing today is just going to be blah, 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 blah. All right, getting into it. What is a topic cluster? A topic cluster is a group of content that revolves around a central topic and uses a pillar cluster approach to link between related pieces in the cluster. I'm not going to get into what it is. I'm just going to assume that half the people in here know what a topic cluster is, and that is good enough for me. Now, moving on, what can you do with a topic cluster? I just want to highlight the things that I think are the most important, and that starts with improving your internal linking structure, becoming an authority. For me, this is like one of the main things why we build topic clusters, especially as we go into this age of generative AI or generative search. Next, show connection between related content, reduce bounce rate and increase draw time, increase the number of pages that visitors engage with, close content gaps, create repurposing opportunities, and avoid keyword cannibalization by grouping subsections correctly. That means that if you're building your cluster right, you're not going to be having cases where there are keyword cannibalization when you're creating your content. It saves a lot of time and money. All right. In my head, I think of a topic cluster as a rabbit hole. Ignore this dark, crazy person doing this shit. I'm thinking of a cluster as I get in here, I walk in here, I walk in here, I walk in here until I'm inside this deep rabbit hole that I cannot bring myself out of. And this is what it looks like now. A really good example for me is Content Marketing Institute. When I click on that search result of what is content marketing, they pop up. I go into the result and I see this. What is content marketing? It looks simple enough, but as you start to go down the page, it really starts to evolve. You have this first subheading here, or rather second subheading, and they are taking you to a link on their annual research. It looks like just one piece of content, but it isn't. You have free download, another free download, a conversion asset, and a link that takes you into their sales pipeline. On that same main page, you have something else here. My clicker has passed that. Yes. Yeah, you have this, which is also a conversion asset. Now, I went in here trying to do research, but I ended up giving CMI my email because the asset was so good. All right. Now that you've seen what it, what it is and what it does, how do you actually do comprehensive research when you're building a topic cluster? It starts with knowing who your audience is. If you know your audience, you can create content that is going to really be helpful to them. Now, the next one is figuring out the home. As you're building your topic cluster, you need to be asking yourself, who is the direct audience that I'm serving? Who are the other people that the cluster can also be applied to? I think a good way to find this answer is with competitive research and community research. I'm going to dig into this very soon. Now, you want to also conduct a content, a content audit. In this context, a content audit is not the full comprehensive website audit we're doing here. We're just doing an audit for the topic. Let's use the topic of sales pipeline. That means that we're going to be doing something that looks like this. We're going to look at our website and ask ourselves, what do we already have around this topic? 
what is the performance like? The top performing pieces are going to serve as not exactly the cluster, but the ones that we're going to be driving link juice from to the new content pieces that we create. What is not performing well? Do we need to consolidate, delete, rewrite? What do we do with that content? Then you do keyword research, and then you have the gap analysis to find new topics. And where it gets interesting for me, audience insights, insights from sales calls, FAQ from customer support, topical sales enablement content. What this means is that you're looking for all the content pieces around this specific topic of sales pipeline that is going to serve as sales enablement assets. And then finally, social listening. All right, let's break it down. First step, turn to your audience. Survey tools, for me, has to be like the absolute best way to get insight from your audience around the problems that they face when talking about a specific topic. The next one is keyword research. And since, I'm, since I am a very, very lazy human being, I always start with gap analysis because it's just the easiest way for me to find specific topic, specific questions, specific solutions, and even my audience when I'm doing the research. If I take all of this now, the client here is Engage Bay. You can't really see it clearly here. And then I do the gap analysis. I can now filter that result by missing an untapped keyword. If I'm trying to find specific audience type, I just need to filter the results further with the word for, F-O-R. And then it starts to show me all the different audience type that are going to be using that solution. Now, another great thing I like to do is topic research. And I'm not even thinking about keywords in terms of search volume at this point. I'm thinking about what can I cover throughout the whole funnel, top, middle, bottom, and even post purchase that is going to help me to build authority when I build my cluster. All right, next one, I also use Bozumo to find what is trending right now, what is really performing well, what is getting the most shares around this specific topic. Then I want to go on social media to see what industry folks are saying about the topic. When I go on social media, I'm looking for recurrent themes, I'm looking for divisive conversations, and I'm looking for popular hashtags. This is an example again with the same keyword of sales pipeline. Something I kept on seeing was that sales pipeline was also being used with the word marketing automation. So if I'm seeing that across many of the conversation that people are having on social media, that tells me that it's now my job to go and look for what is the tie-in between sales pipeline and marketing automation, and how do I make that linkage when I'm having that conversation in my cluster. Now, community research is often overlooked, but it provides insights about your audience and how they search for answers. In fact, there are very few people I know that are doing community research when they are doing keyword research. And that's because we are so fucking obsessed with keywords. Now, Reddit is my favorite tool. Sales pipeline. The community I'm going to inside Reddit is sales. And I'm just looking at general stuff. What is a sales pipeline? I'm looking at how they are providing the answers. I'm looking at who is talking. I'm looking at what they are saying. And I'm just using that to understand that audience better. But something that really helps me, instead of me going directly to Reddit, is to use the tool called perplexity.ai. I can just go into perplexity, and if I'm trying to understand an audience, I can just say, what are the problems that marketers face with audience insights? And then I can filter that results by Reddit. Perplexity is going to give me all, it's going to basically go into Reddit and then find all those answers that people have provided and just give me everything in a very long bullet list. And it makes my job so much easier. Next, I want to create content for all the problems that my product solve. And a very good way to do this is to ideate with customer support teams, sales teams, all the whole teams that are customer facing, get everybody in a room and ideate. Ideate, English is a bullshit language. Ideate on all the problems that the product solves. Now, you have all these keywords, you have all these topics, you've dumped everything in an Excel spreadsheet. It's time to whittle down the list. What do you focus on? Which of these keywords are completely irrelevant to the topic? Trash and burn. Which of these keywords do not align with your brand messaging? An example of this would be I'm doing a project for a client called Aurelius, and the topic we're looking at is user research. 
But in this context, Aurelius is a user research repository. So a keyword like user research courses is not going to be relevant to what we are trying to look for. The temptation would be to create the content nonetheless because it has a high volume, is a high volume keyword. But what purpose does that serve in the context of us driving conversions or even attracting the right audience to our brand? Which keywords allow you to cast a wider net with your targeting? I will get to this in a minute. Now, you want to think of how you can match the keywords to the different stages of the buyer's journey. ChatGPT can help with clustering, but I'm a very, very neurotic bitch, and I don't trust ChatGPT with clustering. So I would rather use keyword insights for clustering and do it manually. When clustering, I like to adopt an upside down approach for two reasons. Number one is that if you create the top of the funnel content, first of all, you're going to have trouble ranking the content pieces at the middle and the bottom because you'll probably be covering that in the pillar content. Also, if you start from bottoms up, as I like to call it, you have better chances of ranking because you're creating your conversion asset first and then you're building your way to the top as a way to just tie the whole cluster in cohesively. Now, let's look at some middle and bottom of the funnel modifiers and keywords that you should be prioritizing. I'm not going to focus on the top of the funnel because I feel like generative AI is going to swallow all of that up soon. All right, the keyword of best. When I think of the word best, I think of Krista Carter and Beyonce. <laughs> All right, the word best. What kind of keywords are we looking at in here? You can use, let's use this keyword of scheduling software. When we add the modifier best, that is now a keyword. That is generic. We want to go specific and find an audience that that keyword is serving. Best scheduling software for small businesses. But more importantly, we want to explore other product use cases around that keyword that don't even relate to the word of best scheduling software. Picture Calendly here now. Calendly is a scheduling tool, but it's also an organization tool. It's also a sales automation software. It's also a planner app. Keyword gap analysis can help you to identify all the different product use cases for your products. All right, when I'm writing that content around best, I think it's very important for you to use social proof to build trust, press the pain immediately, show the product in action, and show relevant product benefits that corresponds with the pain. I'm going to do another talk at Brighton in a few months, and there will be content teardown that show all of all this stuff in action. Yes, the next one is competitor pages. I want to just move two slides ahead and highlight this. These are keywords and modifiers I think of when writing competitor pages. Brand X versus brand Y, alternative, review, competitors, a mistake we often make is to think that the search intent for all of all these keywords are the same. But again, it's so important to look at the SEP when we're writing this content just to make sure that it is aligned. Now, when writing content around competitor pages, it is so important to scrap reviews, find a recurring pain point around those reviews, use it as your overarching theme to tell a story, Use that in the first headline and then structure the entire storytelling around the pain points. Tell and show how you solve a problem. Highlight one key feature related to the pain points that sets you apart from competitors. And then capture competitor keywords across brands solving a similar problem. Now, the next one is product pages for specific audience types. Kind of like the best scheduling tool for small businesses. And this only works if you know your overarching offer and your audience. It could be a long form blog post like this. Keyword, B2B SEO services. Audience, product-led companies. Landing page, keyword, best accounting software. Audience, freelancers. First things first, always look at the SEP. What is the SEP telling you that the intent is? That is the kind of content that you're going to end up creating. Now, very important when you're writing this kind of pages. You cannot be vague. You should include workflow showing the product in action. Again, use customer reviews from that specific sector to build trust. Personalize the content to the audience's needs. The CTA should either make me 
Yeah, you want to either make me, yeah, value should either make me want to click the CTA or keep reading. Now, I'm going to skip this and go straight to customer success stories because this is so good. It doesn't even have any keyword, but without customer success stories, for me, something is missing in your cluster. You have all of all these educational content, top, middle, bottom. Customer success stories are the things that tie it all together, that make you believable. Now, it has a direct impact on getting people to take action because people trust people. A few tips, use quotes, personalize with a name and a face. Define what success looks like to the customer. Focus on the customer's journey. Highlight measurable results. Make it a video. Again, more tiered and examples on each of these points in my next talk at Brighton SEO. Free ebooks and guides. Now, something that I always see many brands struggle with is what should we be creating as free ebooks? And I think that the thing you should be creating is buying guides, how to choose something. These are the kind of assets that make the lead sales ready before they have that conversation. Here's an example I created for One Stand Wise Smart, choosing the best placement service partner. And here's another example I created for Guru, buying guide how to choose the best intranet software. Now, one tip when writing um, ebooks as, yeah, when writing buying guides as ebooks is to replace the conclusion of an ebook with a one page customer story. Again, we fall into the trap of just educating, 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 but we also want to sell. And I always feel like we can do both. We can educate and we can sell. You have all of all this information telling the customer, this is what you should be looking for, these are the features you should be looking for, this is what the right brand should have. And then at the conclusion, trash that conclusion away. And then tell a customer story relevant to the ebook that you've just written. It's going to make them so much more likely to want to contact the sales team and have that conversation with them. Now, downloadable offers. I don't know, every time I think of Oprah saying, you get a car, you get a car, you get a car. <laughs> freebies, everybody love freebies. Now, these are modifiers that I think of around downloadable offers. Free, templates, plan, checklist, all of all these things are assets that allow you to collect emails and then funnel people into your email list, your sales pipeline, whatever that might be. But what happens after they've converted? What happens after they've given you your email? What happens after they've made a purchase? Is that the end of the journey? No. You should use post-purchase content to take care of your customers, build brand loyalty, and upsell them. Things like your FAQ, your knowledge base section, your email list. There are so many ways that you can continue to nurture the conversation, that you can continue to help your customers use your products in the best way. But again, this only happens if you know your audience, if you know the problems that they face around using your, your solution, and if you are consistently putting your feet, I don't want to say pressing their neck, but that is the only word I can think of. If you are consistently pressing their neck in a good way. All right, finally. Think beyond keywords. Generative AI is coming to serve. I think we probably had like five talks on this stage today talking about generative AI. And none of us planned it. None of us planned talking about it like this. What do we need to do to be preparing for this new age of search? I have been saying this for like since 2019. Google is a monopoly. Google just wants to own everything. They don't want people to leave the search results. And I'm constantly thinking, how do we get more traffic without going through the SEPs? And that is going to happen through owned media and direct traffic. I feel like brand recognition power is going to become more potent. Already, I am going to brands directly and using that search functions on their websites to find answers instead of going through search because I want to prepare myself for the time when they'll start giving me generative answers that I don't trust. Because I don't trust it. People are going to be looking for influencers that they trust, corporators that they trust, SEOs that they trust, brand names that they trust, where they can go and get that information directly. And you need to be positioning yourself to be that trusted source. Now, how do we do this? The only way is to create content that AI cannot replicate. And you can do this with keywords that allow you to showcase your unique insights, mostly at the middle of the funnel. Now, what does that look like? 
opinion pieces, research reports, customer stories, podcasts, thought leadership video interviews, roundups, and I feel most importantly, growing communities. We have become lazy. SEOs, I'm talking to you, you, you. We have become lazy. How many people here have not shot a community? Very few people. And this is the thing that is going to allow us to funnel traffic directly from these communities into our websites. The email list talk previously today, that is an excellent way of growing a community. And I think that that is something we need to keep exploring outside of search. Because what happens if in 10 years time, the whole of search is dominated by, oh, sorry, Google achieves their goal of being a monopoly. What happens then? Do we just fall down and die? And that's it for me. Scan this QR code if you want to work with me. Mic drop, but not really.